So again, we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about venous thrombosis. I will come back to arterial thrombosis just a little bit at the very end when we talk about treatment. But I wanted to sort of focus your attention now on this problem of DVTs and PEs. So over the years, we've really had a, a very poor understanding of what it takes to end up with a venous clot. And in the early 1990s, the discovery of something called the Factor V Leiden mutation began a process by which we've really rethought this whole idea about what, what causes a venous clot. And the current model that we have, I think, is a pretty good one. And it seems to be borne out time and again by, by more discoveries, more research. And so we think about this process of genetic predis predisposition plus acquired triggers leading to a venous thrombosis. And this is not something I was taught in med school. And I'm, I'm getting older, but I'm not that old. Um, this is fairly new thinking. And I don't think we've done a very good job of sort of advertising this. We're trying really hard to educate our students and residents and fellows now. Um, but this is relatively new thinking. And so a lot of physicians out there in practice didn't get this. And if we don't do a good job of getting the word out there and educating, it makes, it makes for a lot of difficulty in understanding how to best prevent and treat venous thrombosis. So we're going to work with this model and kind of talk about the different genetic predisposing factors that we know about. There's many that we don't know about. We'll talk some about the acquired triggers. And again, this whole idea of, of being predisposed to something and then having something else come along that puts you at increased risk. If somebody has surgery, for example, and they're genetically predisposed, there's a higher chance of getting a clot out of the deal than, than if someone doesn't have those things happening. So it's really an interaction of risk factors. And that gives us more opportunities to intervene. If, if we understand what goes into the risk, we have lots of places we can step in and try to prevent this equation from being satisfied, so to speak. So what about genetic thrombophilia? And you're going to hear a lot more about this in, uh, from Matt Bauer this afternoon. Um, but just to kind of get started with that whole idea, how do we look for this? Well, the first thing is to ask family history. So anybody in your family had a clot? Um, you know, depending on how well you know your family, how well people talk about stuff like this, we get all kinds of different answers. But I'll tell you, if you really start to dig, it's amazing what, what people will tell you. Um, we see lots of people that come to clinic. We have this conversation. And then we'll get a call a week later saying, guess what I found out? And so it's really important to talk to your family. It's important to know about your family's medical history. And you've got to ask questions. And so um, you know, it's important that you rec recognize that we have ways of identifying genetic thrombophilia just by asking questions. We haven't even spent any money other than just talking to people. Um, there are some blood tests. If you want to spend money, sure, we can do that. So um, there are a lot of blood tests that we can do that look at some of the genetic risk factors. But it's really important to understand that we don't know most of the genetic risk factors out there. So if we take families where it's very clear there's a genetic problem, and I don't mean because they all look funny. I mean because there's lots of people with clotting. So you sit down at Christmas or, or Easter or some family gathering. You say, who's had a blood clot? All the hands go up. If you take families like that and you do all the genetic tests that we have, we only find something in half of those families. So it's very obvious there are a lot of genetic risk factors for clotting that we just don't have tests to, to, to diagnose yet. And so taking a family history is still an extremely important part of our evaluation. The other thing that's really important about this is when you start looking at some of the more common genetic clotting tendencies, like factor V Leiden, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, it's very clear to us that there are a lot of families who have many individuals that have genetic risk factors, and yet no one seems to really clot. That tells us there are probably other genetic factors that either protect you from clotting or maybe you have to have more than one genetic risk factor to actually end up with a clot. So there's a lot more we need to understand about this. And although our blood tests are, are pretty good, we can learn a lot, just a simple family history, just, just sitting down and talking to people um, gives us a tremendous amount of information. I don't think we emphasize that enough in medical education today. I think we focus on technology, doing fancy tests and expensive scans. And you know, talk is cheap, I guess, is, is one way of saying it. So, um, it's really important to do a good job of that. I'm very lucky that I have a group of genetics counselors that work with me. They do this for me. Um, I walk into clinic, and they've got it all laid out on paper. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have that. But it's important that we educate people to talk to their families about these things so that we can get that information and help make medical decisions appropriately. So here's a list of things. And I don't want to go over this in too much detail. Some of these might be familiar to you. Um, I just want to show you the list of things that we currently test for commonly. So in the box are the sort of classic and common genetic clotting tendencies, the factor V Leiden, the prothrombin gene mutation. These are the most common ones. Factor V Leiden was discovered in the early 90s. The prothrombin gene mutation was discovered in the late 90s. Um, turns out these are very, very common. And I'm, I'm going to spend a few more minutes on the next slide talking about those. The sort of classic genetic clotting tendencies that we've known about for 20, 30 years are protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, 
in something called antithrombin deficiency. It used to be called antithrombin-3. Um, these are proteins that are important in regulating the clotting system. And when you don't have enough of those proteins, you have a tendency to clot excessively. And these have been described since the late 70s, early 80s. And it really wasn't until Factor V Leiden came around in the early 90s that we really began to sort of enter the modern era of thinking about how venous thrombosis works. And there are a few other things on the list that I don't want to spend any time on because they're pretty uncommon. Um, again, this whole model that we think about with, with genetic predisposition plus acquired triggers leading to clotting, that really became very clear when we recognized how common Factor V Leiden and the prothrombin gene mutation are. So if you think about the classical genetic thrombophilia as protein C, protein S, and antithrombin deficiency. These are very, very well known because they've been known about for many years, but they're actually pretty uncommon. We don't see these too often, even in a clinic like ours where this is all we do. You know, these people don't just walk in every day. And so, um, you know, the, the tendency used to be that we thought, well, genetic clot intensities are out there, but, you know, they're not that common. We're not going to find them. And, and so we really didn't understand how this all works until we discovered these very, very common mutations. These people tend to have a very strong family, of thrombo family history of thrombosis. So if you've got protein C, protein S, or antithrombin deficiency, there's a really good chance you've got a family history of clotting. So rare disorders, very strong risk factors for clotting. And that was the model for many, many years. Factor V Leiden and prothrombin gene mutation come along. Turns out these are very, very common. In fact, most people with these things will never, ever clot. Well, that completely goes against the grain of what we'd thought for all these years when we thought uncommon, strong risk factor here we've got very common and really pretty weak risk factor in and of themselves for clotting. And so it became very clear when we realized how common these things were that it took more than having a genetic glitch to lead to an increased risk for clotting. So this whole model of genes plus triggers equals clot is something that's really come to light from the discovery of these two very common mutations.